so basically, the coronavirus pandemic has created a major ruckus in our globalized economy. People are now more inclined to isolationism, and there is a growing concern in many countries on their reliance on foreign imports and trade imbalances. I stick my neck out for nobody. A wise foreign policy. Also, there's recessions and contractions happening all over the world, and we will likely see, as a result of all these factors, the implementation of two very different schools of thought regarding economic recovery that you will definitely see in comparative government and macroeconomics. And the two theories are import substitution and structural adjustment, and they are in essence two sets of macroeconomic thought that help governments and economies recover from recessions, financial crises, and they are often in competition with one another. Import substitution, for example, is more geared towards the Keynesian school and espouses nationalism to a degree, and structural adjustment favors more globalization and neoliberalism, more in line with the Chicago School of Thought. And if you're interested in the difference between the Keynesian School and the Chicago School and want to learn about those two economic theories, I've made a video in the past and you can click right there to watch. I'll start off discussing structural adjustment policy. Now, structural adjustment policy is usually practiced by multinational organizations like the World Bank or the IMF in conjunction with governments like the United States. America, yeah. So here are some ways that structural adjustment helps stabilizes the economy. First, they try to get the government to rein in on deficit spending so they don't continue to devalue their currency and cause inflation, cut wages, eliminate subsidies and price controls, and promote a more liberal economy. They will try and privatize industries, improve governance and fight corruption, hence the right of foreign investors through international law. New financial institutions would be created and they would be more welcoming of foreign companies, and this is especially true when it comes to the energy sector. Structural adjustment has also been a tactic of the Cold War for the United States to gain more allies. Ever since the presidency of Harry S. Truman, the government has also been giving out a lot of loans to spread free markets in the third world. That way they can foster direct investment, gain contracts to build infrastructure, and allow for industry to extract resources. Now some of the problems attributed with this macroeconomic practice is the misplacement of interests. Since it's based on what's best for economic development and investors, structural adjustment policies will be mainly targeting major cities and economic hubs. So that means that smaller towns and villages in many of the third world countries that it intends to help don't really reap the rewards of better roads, bridges, or telephone poles for that matter. There's a lack of profit motive to go into those low incentive areas and thus lead to more of a class divide, wealth inequality, and foreign companies getting most of the profits rather than benefiting the people that intends to help. <laughs> also, structural adjustment provides a lot of long-term loans with interest, so that could indebt countries who can't pay that back necessarily. The opposing side of the aforementioned school of thought is the import substitution policy, which essentially means self-sufficiency in the market. Now, this gained a lot of traction at the end of the Second World War in mainly poor third world countries. And it's an idea that was strongly advocated for by American founding father and Secretary of the Treasury, Alexander Hamilton. Alexander Hamilton. What this advocates for is that a nation should develop its own domestic industries enough to sustain itself so that it has the ability to participate competitively in the global market. Fine. I'll do it myself. This theory is heavily based on Keynesian models and financed by a lot of government spending. And import substitution was used in Latin America after the Great Depression up until the 1980s. Now, given the economic conditions of the modern day, you should see a lot of enthusiasm for import substitution. A lot of countries are realizing that they can't produce enough tests, PPE, or food supply in their own factories, and that they're too reliant on supply chains in countries like China, Thailand, or Vietnam. Therefore, many more leaders will be wanting to develop more of a robust industry within their own borders so that when crises arise, they can efficiently produce what is needed and not rely on the economic performance of a country in Asia, for example. Now, the problem with import substitution is that it's a type of macroeconomy that is very expensive to operate. Economists say, well, that import substitution can produce growth and create jobs in the short run, in the long run, output would decrease. Protectionism also could lead to misallocation of resources, higher prices, and less competitive incentives, and even lower exchange rates. 
You said it, the rent is too damn high. This was the case for Mexico and many Latin American countries as they tried to use import substitution to fight recessions and financial crises. It was not very sustainable in the long run because the cost of producing many goods within their own borders was very high and their economy had to rely on a lot of deficit spending, which led to inflation. So that was import substitution and structural adjustment in layman's terms. And I hope you have a better understanding of those two concepts. Thank you for watching and have a good day. What the f does that mean?